just sit there basking the euphoria. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the Canadian Film Fest industry panel. I am the industry series producer, Jen Pogue. Um, here at the CFF, we are devoted to the celebration, promotion, and advancement of Canadian filmmaking talent. Um, thank you to everybody who's watching today on behalf of the CFF. We hope you are staying safe and healthy. An immense thank you to our frontline essential workers who are out there putting their health at risk for, to ensure our safety. Thank you to those who have stayed home throughout this weird time in an effort to flatten the COVID-19 curve. Because we're home, CFF is launching our first ever virtual industry series across the nation. This would not be possible at all without the help from our own personal superheroes, Super Channel, uh, the, the distillery restaurants, Retake, and um, Retake Furniture Rentals, and Ontario Creates. We love you guys, thank you. Please check out our Canadian Film Fest website for more information on our industry panels and events that are coming up uh, next week, and um, as well as our stellar lineup of films. So we will be taking audience questions throughout this conversation. Please feel free to write your questions and comment sections below in our Facebook or YouTube feeds. Just for everyone out there, we've had some Facebook problems today. If, you, if our connection conks out, please head over to YouTube. They are going strong this afternoon. Um, uh, we'll be feeding your questions to our moderator, Annie, at the end of this conversation. So Annie, um, I'm very happy to introduce you. Thank you so much for heading this panel today. Um, Annie Bradley is a multi-award winning director and writer. She is the alumni, she's alumni of the Sundance Film Festival, the TIFF Talent Lab, the CFC Directors Lab, Film Fatales, AWD, Women in the Director's Chair, and is the second vice chair of the Directors Guild of Canada Ontario Board. Her many, many directing credits um, include Blow Back the Film, I'm Going to Break Your Heart documentary on Crave, Good Witch, Tempted by Danger, and much, much more awesome, awesome stuff. I'm also one of her biggest fans. Uh, so thank you, Annie, and I will let you take the conversation from here. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? All good? Absolutely. Okay. Hello. Hello, hello to my illustrious panel <laughs> and uh, to our audience. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon um, where we get to the heart of the agent talent relationship. So uh, I think um, really what I want to accomplish this afternoon is sort of go through the full, the full arc of how to get in a, you know, of, of being a, 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 being an artist or being a director, writer, et cetera, uh, how you get on the radar of an agent once you do get an agent, if you're lucky enough to get an agent, you know, what does that relationship entail? I think there's a lot of mythology around the fact that once you get an agent, you'll just start working. And I really want to get into the, the, uh, the conversation about how that relationship is, is twofold. So it's not just the agent's responsibility, it's also the talent's responsibility to help the agent get them work and, and to continue to work, et cetera. And so we'll go through all of that and, um, take your questions and maybe if we're very lucky at the end, we'll get into building a career beyond Canada and a little bit of the COVID update. So uh, without further ado, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand it off and we'll just do a little round robin where if everybody could just introduce yourselves and just give us a brief encapsulation of the type of talent that you represent. Amy, wanna start? Uh, my name's Amy Stahlberg. I'm an agent at Vanguard Artist Management. We rep writers, directors, producers, composers, uh, cinematographers, production designers, editors, everything but actors. All right, Jody. Hi, I'm Jody with uh, Integral Artists and uh, I actually do the same thing. I rep anybody behind the camera. If you're behind the camera, that's my thing. All right, Glenn. Hi, I'm uh, with Meridian Artists. We represent uh, screenwriters, directors, key creatives, authors, and actors. And Saurabh? Hey, I'm Saurabh Merchant. Uh, I work at the Characters Talent Agency. Characters is a full service agency. We do actors, lit as well. I work in the lit department. That's writers, directors, and key creatives behind, below the line. Okay, great. So I think that we, I wanted to start off with somewhat uh, discussion about the groundwork in, in regards to talent building their brand. I think like the work that, uh, that might go into 
um, getting yourself out there and getting yourself uh, towards, you know, perhaps trying to get the attention of an agent and how that, you know, what you look for and how you sort of track people or find people, et cetera. So, um, and also this big question, what do you think creatives should do before they reach out for representation? And what is the appropriate time in a career to reach out for representation? Who would like to take the lead? So Rob? Um, well, I think that uh, in terms of when is the appropriate time, it really depends, I think, on when you are ready in your career, when you feel you are reached a point where you've done what you can in order to get to the next stage of what you want in your career, you can't do that without help, without uh, assistance. And ultimately, I think as an agent or a manager, what our job is fundamentally is to help you get to your career goals and uh, help execute whatever those career goals are. So I've signed clients who have been at the very, very beginning of their career. I've signed clients mid-career, signed cl clients at the peak of their career. Uh, well, not necessarily the peak, but at a very high point in their career. It really depends on, I think, what you feel is missing and what's not happening and what you want that agent to accomplish, uh, if that makes sense. Um, I, 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 and I think the, to the second question, what do you, what you need? That's what, that was the other question, right, Annie? Yeah. So what you need, I think what you need is um, to have a portfolio, to have material that you are excited about, passionate about, something that you are ready to, to share, to, to sell. You know, as an agent, that, that, that's what we look for. That's what I look for in terms of that. Great. Do I also think you? it's, yeah, it's important to know when you want to actually build a team. I think being mm -hmm. creative, you're doing things by yourself. You're trying to, trying this, trying that, and making that all happen. But really, when you want to start to trust people and bring them into that relationship and kind of grow that, I think is very important. You know, and it, it, for different people, it's different times. Mm -hmm. It's totally Absolutely. different times. Yeah. Glenn? Do you have any thoughts on, you know, when, when people are coming in to see you, do you expect them to already have like a real website or is that part of something that you want to help create with that, with that, or at least a body of work? Yeah. I, well, you know, I think, uh, I'm a, I, I like uh, kind of sports analogies with stuff like this. And I think some people go to YCA, YMCA and they shoot a basket and they think, Oh, I should go to the NBA. And they start trying to get to the NBA with one basket being shot. And that's too early. Obviously, at the same time, you can't spend 100 years at the gym before you, you, you kind of come out. So it's the same thing for us with representation. Should it be the first word you write? No. Should it be the, you know, should you write for 10 years before you look for representation? No. It's really an impossible question to answer because everyone's going to be ready at a different point in time. I think, I think what I would suggest most people do is really just take a, a a signal from the industry in terms of what kind of feedback they're getting. If you took your short out and you didn't get into any single festival in the country, it's probably not the right time to send that short out to agents looking for representation. At the same time, if you do send a short out that did get into a couple of festivals and all the agents you sent it to turned you down, that doesn't mean you should think of that as a permanent no forever. It just means you're probably still not ready. You need to do another short, do something different to your next short or whatever it's going to be so that you can get the attention of those agents. And, and trying to get some feedback on why you've been turned down is probably a good thing to do if any agent is willing to give you that feedback. Um, but it, it's a bit of a testing process and it's, there isn't one specific time but, um, but it's also about building a relationship, building a professionalism. We've, we've signed a lot of people that we've turned down twice before. And the third time they were ready for representation. But the big thing for us in that third time was we were seeing the progression of them getting better, them acting as artists, them finding their voice, them being professional in their interactions with us, which made, made us more confident that they would make a good client. And just on that note, I think that everybody on this panel are actually uh, managerial agents. So uh, you may go to other agencies who have strong lines in the sand of when they'll look at you. I think everybody here really open. Um, speaking for Vanguard, I think it's really important that people understand their voice, even if where you are at is not where you wanna be, or even if your um, 
have aspirations to be other things, at least if you have an understanding of yourself and to touch on what Glenn, what Glenn's saying, have a voice that's unique and strong, uh, that's when we'll look at you. I think Glenn, you so you mentioned something, and I think this is very interesting. So, um, you know, I like that idea of what do you do if you're unsuccessful in, in acquiring representation? You know what I mean? A lot of people, I think, you know, do have a body of work and they go out and they don't secure representation. And um, so I'm just like, you know, how do you continue to stay in their radar? What do you guys like when, you know, people try to continue to build on that relationship to keep in touch? I think the relationship is really important, right? It, different agents have different things and different people around them and stuff. And as you kind of grow with somebody and see where they're at and help them their career and all that stuff, it, it takes time. It's not a quick little thing all of a sudden. Oh, okay, here's the agent. Let's go. It, it's really it's really important that over time you you actually trust your agent. Your agent trusts you, and that 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 doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. That takes time and effort, and so it it it's a progression, right? Yeah, so if it doesn't happen like right away, there are reasons why. Um, mm -hmm. There can be practical reasons. Um, you know, you might not have enough on your slate yet to, for someone to really sink in and do right by you and work with you. You know, you need that um, when you're working with an agent. Um, or there might be something, I hate to say, it, are we allowed to give hard truths here? <laughs> you're not, <laughs> you're not okay. developed yet. You know, and it's not, yeah. it's not, it doesn't make sense yet. Um, mm -hmm. Or, uh, or there's some, you're lacking some sort of professionalism that's necessary. Um, you know, you're an extent, ultimately at the end of the day, your clients or our clients are an extension of us and vice versa. So you kind of need to be at a point where you act a certain way in the industry and, um, it's hard to, there's no blueprint on how to do that so okay. uh if it doesn't happen right away it doesn't mean you're you're not going to have the right representation at some point uh it just means it might take a little time right so I, I think what we're getting from everybody across the board is if it doesn't happen the first time it's it's the extent it's like keep going keep developing your voice keep mm -hmm. doing the work keep getting short films out there you know, going, you know, doing that sort of networking, et cetera, and trying to sort of stay in touch with the people that you were interested in reaching out to or would be interested in having represented you or perhaps gave you the most positive feedback and helping you build that voice and then try to stay in touch with them and come back with, you know, more work and, and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Is that, yeah, that sounds pretty much like what we're saying? Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. And I think like to go along with that, one of the things but and Glenn kind of touched on this that is really interesting to me when I you know when people that I've been talking to over the course of a year or two years is that when they come back they say oh and I've done this other thing and I've also done this and I'm working with so and so and it, like to me that's really exciting not just because it shows your growth and development as an artist but it also shows me that you're out there you're you're doing the you're doing the work you're also doing the hustle out there which is really exciting and you know shows me you're hungry you really want it too yeah and that work is the hardest part right mm -hmm. we, we as agents want people who are going to do that work and not just expect that it's just going to happen magically because no. really it doesn't happen magically it's yeah. it's it's a it's a, a marathon and are you gonna you know run that marathon and do that work and and actually put everything into it to make it happen right right glenn did you have anything you want to add to that before we yeah, I was just going to say two things. One is it's not a secret. I think sometimes uh, people are looking for the secret to get representation and the secret on how to approach an agent. It's it's kind of basic business skills. And, and those business skills are important to us because if we're going to represent you and you're going to be out in the world for the next 10 years as our client, we also want to know that your interactions with other people are going to be professional as well. So just even you know, it's one thing to be creative. It's one thing to have a great script or a great short film, but also just having some basic professional skills on how to send emails, on when to follow up. And if you don't know those things, you know, just talk to your friends who have regular office jobs or are career minded who have kind of networked in other industries to just get a sense of what those skills are, um, because they're very important both in approaching us and in the long term. The second part of it would be to uh, uh, no entitlement. Coming to an agent with an immediate sense of entitlement, i.e., 
I've done a short film. I want to direct Game of Thrones. How can you make that happen for me? Is an almost an immediate pass for us just because there's a lot of work that still needs to be done between a short and your first episode of television, let alone the pinnacle of your career. And so we want to know that people are can be engaged in that work process, not just like they've done the basic minimum and now they have a career that's owed to them. Exactly. If, we, if you start off with the entitlement, what's going to happen later, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay, so let's say that we do, we have achieved, so we've, we've been accepted by an agency, we've, uh, we've, you know, we do have representation. I like to talk about, I like to call it the partnership. That's the way I look at totally. my relationship mm -hmm. with my agent. Um, you know, and I, it's, it's been an extraordinary, you know, uh, you know, relationship that I that I uh, recently have, you know, gotten with my agent. And um, so what, what do you, what do you guys see as the role of the agent in creative career building? I mean, I always, uh, I know we, we, Amy, you brought this up, we tend to be a little bit more managerial uh, agents here on this panel anyway, for sure, and mine as well. Um, and I know in the States, that's a different, that's a different role. There are agents and managers. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about what you think the responsibilities are of each partner, the talent and yourself. For example, do agents get you work? Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I think I, obviously yes, but uh, sometimes things are more fluid. Uh, yeah. You know, then everyone's networking, everyone has relationships, everyone throws their relationships into the pot in, in this kind of situation and this special, very special business relationship. And um, opportunities can come any, from anywhere at all mm -hmm. times if everyone's doing their job, uh, which then leads me into talking about what, what job that is. Um, <laughs> so on our part, we're, you know, we're part PR, part manager, part staffing agent, part script reader, part dream therapist. Part <laughs> therapist. <laughs> part, I mean, there's a lot of parts to the job and a lot of invisible work is done as um, an agent as well. Um, on the part of the client, our expectation, at least at Vanguard, is that uh, they're always working, they're always striving, they're always writing. If they're a writer, they're always writing and creating um, new work to, again, harness that voice and also give us things to be able to bring to market. Um, that their networking um, doesn't have to be, it can be in their own way, but they're, mm -hmm. they have to be out there. You can't be just sitting at home quietly working all the time. And um, there has to be like big lines of communication open between the client Huge. and the mm -hmm. um, agent. Uh, and depending how the agency works, I mean, a, a Vanguard, there'd be four people on one person and a team, you'd have your point people, but uh, there's lots of people looking out for you. So it would be um, just constant communication, not just about the big picture, but also the small things. Cause you never know where you can like fill in that gap just a bit to help a client take it to the next level. Um, someone else? <laughs> no, I yeah. also think you, oh, go, go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, like, I think, like, one of the ways I like to think about it as an agent is that we help open doors, we create relationships, we create networks for you, but ultimately it's the client is gonna book the gig in the interview. The client is the one through virtue of their work, their reputation, their personality, that is what's going to eventually get that booking. So I can get you into that chair. I can get you that interview. Ultimately, it's your, you're going to be the one in the interview. I'm not give, taking the interview. You're the one in that moment with the showrunner, that producer, that director, what have you, right? And that's what's going to, that's what's going to sell it or sell the show, sell, sell yourself ultimately. Yeah, what I was going to say is we kind of go one way, you go another way, right? And we're just kind of making that happen for you. And together as a team, if you're going one way and we're going one way, it doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? That, that relationship doesn't work. We have to be communicating and work together to, to have that same goal together, which is very important. Mm -hmm. And Glenn, do you have anything? I, I, I wonder about, I, I wonder sometimes when I think... Um, you know, when you're looking for an agent, when you are looking for an agent, uh, sometimes, you know, 
I used to always look at roster, you know, and I'd look at other people whose work I admired uh, and I would look at who represented them. P sure. Is there any, is there any truth in that in the sense of like looking at roster size or looking at, you know, the clients that they already have? Is that part of the sort of the, you know, the work that a talent, you know, the talent should do to look at the agency that they're approaching? They should do their research. You should do your research and look at, you know, not just the agents, but the companies they work for, the agencies they work for and kind of see, oh, I, I look, I see this company is really has a lot of comedians, has a lot of comic writers, a lot of, you know, focus. I don't do comedy. Are these guys the best fit? Do, will they know, are they able to handle that, right? I, I think research is, a, it's a big part of, you know, your responsibility as talent when looking at an agent or agency is saying, oh, I really, I really like that. I think part of it uh, is what you were saying, Annie, like, oh, wow, these people represent these five other talent that I think are amazing and I've loved their, not just their work, but their career, like the way their career has developed and grown. That's really interesting. And I, I, I think that's a valid kind of, you know, tool of research mechanism for sure. But I don't think you can compare other people's career with your career either. No. Everybody's individual, mm -hmm. being creative is your own thing. And you can't say, oh, this person did that. So I got to do that, mm -hmm. right? You, you, you do have to find your own way and what works and who you are and you know build a team of people that kind of you trust and trust you to make that happen you can't rely on you know what this person did that you're going to be able to follow that at all mm -hmm. it just doesn't work and and you know and would you say that i i think i think sometimes that there is this this you know this need to have representation you know what i mean to make you hireable um, and sometimes people just go, you know, they'll, instead of really finding that right person, like you're saying, that right relationship, et cetera, they try to get the first person that will represent them. And where does that usually go? Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Not always yeah. the best. Yeah. Um, so what do you, let's be specific here. And what would you, uh, I want to talk about specializing in certain genres. Um, I have this conversation an awful lot. Uh, with Americans, because they're always amazed that Canadians can do sort of cross genre platform work. And uh, I always say, well, it's because we just don't have a big enough marketplace that we have to special, we could specialize in it. So maybe you could just talk to that about clients that, do you encourage them to, to specialize in a certain genre or do we have to be sort of have a broader base of, of craft? Actually, I'm actually really curious to hear what my other panelists' thoughts are, because like, I actually think at the way our content has developed and the way that what we're watching has changed over the last five or even 10 years, it's becoming, everyone is doing everything. And so when I talk to clients and I, I've had this, I've had that conversation with clients as well, Annie, as I'm sure you've had with your, your agents, I've had that with my clients is, should I specialize if I only do this, do I get pigeonholed? Is this, is this good? And truthfully, I think like there's, the audience is so fragmented these days. It, it's, it's about finding the audience that speaks to your voice and that who clicks in with your voice, I think. So I, I don't necessarily, I don't, I think being broad is better because there is more opportunities and, you know, there's some of the biggest talents that we're seeing coming out. They're not, they're not specialized, they're broad. I mean, what category would you put someone like Phoebe Waller-Bridge in, right? Like that, so I think there's opportunities for writers or for creatives to be everywhere, to do everything, you know? But I don't know, I'm curious as to what you guys think as well about that genuinely. Well, I think you are gonna get pigeonholed no matter what you do, right? You, you do, so everyone's gonna look at your CV and say, oh, my project's here. They've, it's already it hasn't been produced yet but it's on their cv okay i'm gonna hire them and go and i think that process is really important right whether it's good or not it doesn't really matter it just it happens everybody wants to work with somebody who mm -hmm. you know can do what they need done mm -hmm. and and you will be pigeonholed and and it's a matter of you know finding what is important to you and what you want to do and trying to work towards those goals to make that happen for your career Len, amy uh, I'll jump in. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's there's it's a, it's a very wide range of conversation here because we're we're talking. We can also be talking about people at different stages in their career. So, yeah. totally. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 
know, our take would be uh, early on, you should probably specialize. Um, and the reason for that is, and let's just use our favorite, in, in terms of writers anyway, in Canada, let's use procedurals. If you are trying to break into procedural world and get a job at a broadcaster and get on the broadcaster's radar, and uh, you have a half hour multicam comedy sample and a one hour uh, horror sample and uh, one procedural sample and so on and so forth, it's great to have that broad and maybe yes, that gives you access to more opportunities, but it's not about access to the opportunities, it's about closing the opportunity into a gig. And so we would encourage if someone wanted to break in, especially into the drama world, the procedural world here in Canada, you might want to focus on writing a procedural, writing another procedural, writing another one, get really, really good at it. Then you get on Rookie Blue for five seasons. And while you're on Rookie Blue, then you go off and you write your family drama, you write your horror feature film, you do whatever, because you've locked down that gig, you've built a foundation from which you can now grow your career. And so that's not universal advice for everybody. Uh, and, and certainly just to be clear, we would have this conversation with every single client or prospective client that came in. Right. But generally speaking, it's hard. Everything that we do in this industry is hard. Writing anything or directing anything is hard. And what you don't want to do is go into a meeting on a show and say, oh my gosh, I would love to write this, this for this show. It would be a real challenge for me to try and figure that out. Or a stepping stone. <laughs> real stepping stone. Yeah. <laughs> now you want to go in and say, with all the work I've done in this field, this is what I know and understand. And so um, uh, so there is some value to specialization. Now, at the same time, if we were talking later in your career, you've done 10 years of, of procedurals. At that point, we're definitely having a conversation with our client about, you, you know, you've done 10 years of procedurals. This is getting really, really stale. You're going to regret it soon. You haven't written a new sample in six years. Da, 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 da. You got to expand it. Da, da, da. So it's, the, the conversation obviously changes over time, but there is value in specialization, I think, earlier on. I think just to touch on that, um, or just in addition to that, um, there's something that's like even um, more detailed, I think here, Annie, which is that um, there has to be kind of a through line. So like, let me try and find the right words. It would have to be, you can kind of, you, as a agent, you kind of like, at least we do, try and envision someone's career and then work backwards. How, like, what's the big dream? And then what are the steps that got you there? And so specializing, um, it should be even more detailed like, than that. It'd be like uh, interesting family dynamics. You can write like really great characters. Uh, you're a huge world builder. Um, complicated characters like Phoebe Waller-Bridge, her through line, no matter like what she writes, are these complicated female mm -hmm. characters that you fall in love with them, even if they're not that likable. So yeah. I, it's like, if you, if she, she could write anything, she truly could write anything and mm -hmm. she could write anything in any genre, half hour, hour, play, feature, as long as that was still there, because that's what, that's what defines her. And I think we're getting back to that once again, when you brought you brought this up earlier, Amy, which is about you're looking for that art, that voice, the building and the, and the development. I Glenn, and Glenn, this is obviously goes to you too. It's part craft, but it's also part, that's the artistry of it is to combine those two things towards building a career. Um, so I guess here, this- I was just gonna say, part of what we've all been talking about and it kind of ties a little bit of it together is if you are a single camera comedy director, and you want to get on to directing Game of Thrones, our job is also to help you map that out. You know, what mm -hmm. is the gig that gets you a little bit closer? Okay, so we got to kind of convert comedy into drama somehow. So maybe a half hour drama. That half hour drama converts into a one hour drama. That one hour drama gets you on HBO's radar. Next thing, and so it's, it's a plan. It's about mapping that out and having an idea of how that works. Uh, and being on the same page and trusting each other as, as partners in that process to to stay on that path yeah so building a strategy for your client you know what i mean mm -hmm. like everybody talking about having those conversations about what are the goals are they achievable how do we get there and you know you, building on the skills and the opportunities that we have already right yeah. mm -hmm. okay great and what do you need to do you know i think i think once again this is that 
thing is like having those conversations always and trying to do that work. And what do you do while you're waiting for that next opportunity? You know, like what can you go out and do, i.e. Amy, but being out into the world, networking, you know, doing shorts if you have downtime, writing scripts if you have downtime, all of those things just keep building and building. Um, I want to talk about um, maybe some, uh, I always say you learn from the mistakes. Um, what are some of the mistakes that you have seen clients do that maybe potentially cause you to let clients go? Is, I mean, does anybody feel comfortable talking about that? I think that there's something really important in that for people to understand that, um, you know, that they have a responsibility in their career and you can't just sit at home and expect everything to happen, that sort of thing. And so are there any things that sort of words of advice that you'd like to give people? I can start. Uh, <clears throat> I think integrity is a really big word in this business, um, now more so than ever. Um, if you lack integrity or if you, if you misstep in a way that exposes you as someone that we didn't realize you were or um, your belief system, that's definitely like a hard out. There's no, there's no chance that we could salvage that relationship. Um, but other than that, I mean, I think people are humans and we all make mistakes. I mean, no one, on, I'm gonna speak for myself, I make mistakes. And uh, as long as they're not um, the kind of mistakes that you can't overcome, like you have to mm -hmm. be able to overcome, like you, you can't walk into a room and be entitled as a writer. You can't send an angry email to a network if they didn't pick up your show. You can't, like, you can't make these kinds of unprofessional mm. mistakes, but, you know, you can, the odd foot and mouth thing that you, I don't know, that went sideways or a personality conflict, like those things are gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. anybody else, Phil? No, I think that's a great, I, 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 like, I, no, I think that's a really good articulation, absolutely, of that, you know, for sure. So if people don't want to work with you, if people don't want to work with you, then there's nothing we can do about that, right? If you piss somebody off somewhere and you have a reputation that, you know, goes sideways for some reason, that's, like, what, what can we do about that? We can't fix that if it's that bad, right? I will say one other thing, which is not really about like a mistake that someone might make out there, but rather your how you fit in with your agency. Like, mm -hmm. it's okay uh, if things don't work out. Um, if I start to feel uncomfortable for one reason or another, and that grows, it's not good. It's just not yeah. working. Out. It's not yeah. good for anyone. It's not good for me. It's not good for the agency. It's not good for the client and their career I mean it's okay to acknowledge when something's not what you thought it was going to be mm -hmm. and people grow and they change I mean people can weigh in on this but you grow and you change and you may not change with the person yeah and I, th I think I think I've got a, a that leads into a question that I have over here it says for for those who have agents if you're not if it's not working with the agent that you're with you know when should you move on or how do you do that like how can you you know that how can you and that relationship in a positive way. I mean, I would uh, I think, okay. oh, go ahead, Glenn. Yeah. I'll say um, uh, it's like breaking up when you're dating. <laughs> uh, I haven't dated in 20 years, so this is really <laughs> a, 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 my memory what that was like. <laughs> you're not going to go someone, then? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's as simple as that, you know, like, you know, if you, if you can remember back to your dating days, the best way to do it is just rip the bandaid off. It's not to drag it on and, and have the relationship get worse and worse and worse and more soured. Um, it's just to have an honest conversation. I will say the one thing is, again, it's a relationship and it is an industry based on relationships and certainly um, doing it live, either on the phone or in person is a much better way to do it than a voicemail or an email or mm -hmm. a text. Um, all of which are terrible ways to do it because it just mm -hmm. sets that, that new stage in your relationship on the wrong foot. 
And, you know, I can tell you in at least one case in my, my, I had someone who dropped us very unceremoniously. Uh, and then nine months later, it called me up to say, Hey, I made a mistake. And I, but the way they had left us was an indicator of something that I didn't really appreciate about that person. And we did not take them back. Right. 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 So once again, that goes back to the heart of like, you know, this is an industry of relationships, the good ones and the ones that you end. Yes. Et okay. It's great. Great practice to have. Yeah. But um, also presumably, you know, before you get to that point, have that conversation to have those difficult conversations. If, if things aren't working or if you feel something isn't working right, you should be able to like talk to your agent, have that conversation first before yeah. it gets to that point where, you know, either your agent is disillusioned and frustrated or you're disillusioned and frustrated. Talk about it. Talk, talk through what is not working. You know. This actually happened to me. I had, I had someone approach me about representation um, and um, I've been with someone for about 10 years, was looking to make a change. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, we started talking about it and so on and so forth. And then they sent me an email about having a second conversation about switching agencies, but out of bad habit, they actually sent it to their, or their own agent. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> me. But, and, and this is, goes to your points, it started a conversation between the original agent and them. The original agent had no idea there was some dissatisfaction there. They had a very open conversation about it. And that person is still with that original agent in another kind of seven, eight years later. And so that conversation can, can really help you save a relationship and have that before uh, you move on. Exactly, exactly. Make sure you uh, email the right people. <laughs> yes. Number one. Rule number one. Um, I, I just want to, I, I know you all um, have a lot of clients that are very successful in their careers and, and people are at all different levels of their careers, but what, do, you know, you've done this for quite some time, many of you. Um, are there specific characteristics that you see in people that sort of, that seem to make a client successful in their career? I know, Amy, you're talking about integrity, which, you know, I think is like probably the cornerstone of anything and everything, but, it, you know, are there other sort of characteristics that you have seen that you look for in people? I will say that, um, so the owner of Vanguard, Tina Horowitz, um, she always, when we're taking on a client, we, you know, we have a meeting, big meeting, and she always says, is that a, is that a client, is that like a good citizen? Not just of, not just of the community, but of the world or to each other. And if the answer is no, it's probably gonna be a no. Um, they have to be talented, but I think all of us can say like, a lot of the times it does come down to a gut feeling on someone. Can they be, can, can we jump in and help them be successful uh, in life and in career? And um, you just know when you know, like, you, I don't know how it's, it's like a relationship. I think Glenn was saying, it's like a dating relationship. You just know when you know. And yeah. like, that's when the heartbreak comes in. If like, they don't go with you or uh, it doesn't work out, like whatever it is, it's like, you just know when you know. Um, and uh, you have to love something about either their writing or their directing or something you see or something, some way like an editor has pieced the story together or the music that makes you cry when you're watching it or that if it wasn't there, it wouldn't have been as compelling. It's like, I mean, and there are so many agents and so many people out there. There's someone for everybody out there. So it's just about like finding your fit truly. Yeah. And I think to, to go on and like, in terms of like, there isn't like a single checklist of what you can do to become successful that, that works. It's not like that kind of one-stop shop, but I think like in terms of commonalities, yes, it's talent, but it's also willingness to grow and willingness to make yourself better because some talent is innate, but talent also is a craft. It is like, we call it a craft because it's something you develop and you grow and you build right you become a better writer the more you write you become a better director the more you direct so it's the recognition of that that's part of it I think it's that hustle that willing to do that work is also another part of it and I think it's personality it's knowing how to manage relationships understanding what people are asking when they're asking you something what they're really asking for and understanding that it's it, it is part of just being that kind of 
global citizen, as you're saying, Amy, I think it's all part and parcel together. And I just want, I just wanted to, to touch on this. Like sometimes you do have a client that goes out and they do a job and for reasons beyond their control, um, you know, all, not all jobs go well. Sure. What do you guys do with your client? Do you have like a postmortem at all? Or if a client comes to you with a challenge, like how does that relationship work as well? Like how do you approach that? Or if a client has come back to you and said they didn't, you know, we weren't whatever, how do you sort of make that a positive learning? You know, how do you sort of mold and shape that? Well, if you're not communicating and an understanding, then it doesn't work, right? So do you have a specific idea that you're asking in a way or? Or it's just well, if, if, general... if, somebody, if somebody goes out into a job uh, and they and for whatever reason, sometimes it's beyond everybody's control, the job doesn't go well. Um, and and a client comes back to you. How do you sort of impart that information to your client if, and, and sort of. I, know, well, I think it, I'm, obviously it depends on a case by case basis. Of yes, what it is, obviously. Right? Yeah. But but I think communicating and being honest about it is is the only way to do it. Right. If you're not honest and you're, you, we, the relationship's not there. Okay. If, if I'm telling you something that's not there, that doesn't work. If you're telling me something that's not there, it doesn't work. If I know something, I, let's share it. Let's work on it. Let's figure it out. Oh, this happened. Okay. Well, why did it happen? How did it happen? And just being that person that, you know, they can talk to and we can kind of figure it out together, I think is really important. Okay, great. Um, I want to talk a little bit um, about the landscape of hiring practices that um, are happening both uh, here and in the US. And obviously it's, we've seen a little bit of change in the last few years in regards to inclusion, gender, diversity, et cetera. And um, I'm just, I think this is a question that I, I certainly get asked a lot at um, director's caucus meetings, but how do, you, how do you still carve out a career if you don't fit the newest initiatives? The way I uh, the way I've explained this because I've gotten that same question or a form of that question from my clients as I'm sure we all have, um, and the way I've told my clients and what I tell people is that there has always been this amount of competition. It's always been that way. It's just some people have had a privilege of not being in experiencing that directly. That the the level of competition we experience that is, has been like that for many groups for a long, long time. And this is what it is like. This is what the competition level is, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that uh, the bottom line on that, I hope this isn't controversial, is that you're just not at an advantage anymore just because. Yes. Exactly. So we, be better, do better, <laughs> be, be excellent, right? It's like, it's yeah. about time that this happened. So it's just about adjusting to the to, to that new normal. So let's say you take a client and you've got a client now and you're sending them out for meetings. Um, you know, there's generals and there are specific meetings for specific, uh, you know, a, a specific job, um, you know, can you just talk a little bit about um, what you discuss with the client before they go out for a general or a specific job? Do you have any sort of, um, you know, conversations beforehand or suggestions for them, et cetera? I know what I do in regards to research and all that other sort of thing, but maybe you could just talk a little bit about- Just imagine what you do, that you should see <laughs> the, the research that she's put into this panel. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, again, everybody's managerial on this panel. Yeah. This is like a one kind of agent response, but I think everybody here would uh, encourage the client to research, go over that with them, who they're meeting, where they were before, the ideas that they could bring up, uh, brainstorm with them, um, really do like a lot of meeting prep, uh, where ultimately you want that relationship to go. I mean, that's like, there's a lot of, I, I use the word managerial, but there's a lot of managerial parts uh, to this unknown general, right? Um, yeah. And uh, it's, uh, 
talk about their personalities with the client so they can be prepared on that front too and really talk to them about being authentic their authentic self because ultimately it's going to come out anyway so you might as well just be yourself yeah glenn do you have any thoughts on that uh, I think it's there's there's the there's the specific that you do the day before the meeting and also just in a, in a larger general sense, you know, uh, part of it is being a citizen of the industry and um, you should be researching this industry all the time period you should know what's going on you should be reading playback on a regular basis. If you want to work in Canadian television, you should be watching Canadian television. And I'm not saying you need to watch every single episode of the history that's ever been made, but you certainly should be watching one or two episodes a season to see how it's changing. Because we may call you at 6 p.m. on a given day to say, Christina Jenning wants to meet you tomorrow morning to talk about a job on Murdoch Mysteries, and you're not going to be able to do enough research overnight. And so um, there's kind of the, the bigger, broader having an idea of what's going on generally and, and being a citizen. But then other than that, it's the same thing, you know, Amy's covered most of it, but it's just all the details, who you're meeting, why you're meeting them, what the opportunity is, uh, and what questions you should be ready to answer. And what questions to ask as well. And you know, ask. That's something, you know, it's important when you're meeting with people, ask them questions. You should be engaging with them it should be a two-way street be interested <laughs> be interested um let's talk about i'm just looking here to see if there's any of these questions that we haven't um here's one what does representation for a producer look like do any of you represent producers i guess you'd writer producers correct writer producers or director producers? Do you feel the scripts that go to the producer? How do producer fees come into play with this? It's a question. Very specific question. Yes. I, well, I, 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 I'm yeah. Just, we, you know, is a, it, we need to kind of, we don't represent production companies, I can tell you. No. That. That's no. a different model altogether. Producers, it depends on the type of producer it is. We do have some relationships with producers that we uh, that we represent. Um, and it's about a number of things. In some cases, it's it's largely about making sure they're aware of all the opportunities out there because they're off producing a show. And so we're telling them what Bell and Chorus or anyone is looking for because they don't have time to make those phone calls. Um, in some cases, it's actually helping them sell their shows and setting up their shows. In some cases, it is, um, you know, giving them some advice on people that they should be looking at, whether they be Meridian clients or otherwise. It, it's, it's, there isn't, I think, a, there isn't a single recipe for the producers we work with. Okay. I'm finding, um, oh, sorry, Annie. Yeah, no, go ahead, please. I'm just gonna, and like, yeah, I, I mean, further to that, uh, in addition to that, it's just like bringing people, bringing these producers or these showrunner producers or people that have a shingle, uh, books, plays, articles, people, whatever it is that might be interesting to them. That's how we work with them. So let's talk a little bit about, um, cause we're at, we're at about, we're about 10 minutes away from uh, questions. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, building a career beyond Canada. And I know that, you know, for the majority, there probably a large majority of the people watching, um, absolutely, we want to have a, a solid, wonderful career in Canada. Um, there is, there are opportunities beyond Canada. And I know that some of you have agencies that work, you know, on both sides of the border. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, what is required in sort of extending that career beyond Canada and sort of what time, what time is right in their career arc for that? Want to go? I'll go. <laughs> you go, Glenn. <laughs> you go, Glenn. <laughs> we have an office in Los Angeles, and so we represent. We have people on, who work on both sides of the border here. Um, and there was this is actually the longest I've gone in twenty years without being on a plane. I figured that out the other day. It's crazy. <laughs> um, anyway, um, again, it's there isn't a single recipe for this, but yes. I will say um, going too soon can be very detrimental. Um, it kind of depends on what situation you are in your life, how much of a safety blanket you have, 
you know, do you have a partner? Are you carrying a mortgage? Do you have kids? All those kinds of things can all kind of play into the decision. Um, I would say one of the things we like to do is make sure we're planning for it. In other words, we don't like to have found, oh, you know, it's March. We didn't get a job in the last three months. I'm going to go down to LA and see what happens. That's not a great way to do it. Um, you want to kind of build up to a, a, a departure date and try to put the right things on your resume, do the right thing. I will, the thing I think is probably most important, and I can't emphasize this enough to writers uh, and directors, you have to go down with something that's going to grab people's attention. Mm -hmm. Average, ordinary, everyday sample that kind of gets you a batting average of 25% meetings in Canada is not going to get you anything in Los Angeles. You need to go down with a spectacular sample that is going to open the door for you every time, because even in that case, you're still going to have trouble finding work. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So the one great thing about the Canadian marketplace, if you are here and you want to use it, is use this to live a, 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 you know, a healthy life, a protected life, uh, a life near your family, and make it, take advantage of that time to kind of build up a library or portfolio of material or films uh, so you know what's really working in your portfolio and then arrive in Los Angeles with that. Um, it's, it's, you know, you think about the people who arrive in Los Angeles on a daily basis. And if you're coming from Ohio or Nebraska or Wyoming, you're arriving straight out of film school or trying to get into film school. If you're arriving from Toronto or Vancouver, you have the opportunity to actually arrive with a resume. And that can make a real difference to uh, the initial uh, mm -hmm. six to nine months that you're spending in Los Angeles. So if we're just talking about that transition, the number one thing I would I would recommend is you have something that's going to get people's attention and you know is going to get people's attention, not your assuming will. Mm -hmm. I think like having some kind of um, buzz either through a festival, like some festival buzz, like especially if it's a large festival, something like TIFF or Sundance or something like that, really helpful. Having some kind of major awards is really helpful. Um, we don't have an LA office, an LA branch, but I do have clients who work in the United States. Um, by and large, I share them with various US agencies and management companies. And when we are placing clients with other US, US management or agencies, we're looking at building relationships and building a team. And that's really, really crucial, I think, and really important is like figuring out, A, there's the personality fit in the same way that of you finding a Canadian agent. It's also building a team around yourself and having everyone work together for you specifically. And I think that's a really important factor when you're doing that. And that's certainly the, one of the biggest things that we do when we're trying to put that team together. Amy? I mean, you guys have answered it really well. I would say the only thing I will say that's a bit contrarian is that we're seeing it, people go earlier um, because uh, right now things are so and maybe they weren't always or maybe it's come full circle very care like creator driven so someone a playwright might have that we've signed might have huge success right out of the gate in los angeles because um someone really loved that play mm -hmm. Uh, or and so they're not to as prepared, but we would work with them to get as prepared as they possibly mm -hmm. can uh, and up on your feet properly in such a big market. Um, again, to Silrab's point, finding the right team, the right fits, who everyone can work to well together, uh, then thinking about the big picture and the big dream. Jody, I, anything? Yeah, else? I, yeah, no, I also think is it is that like part of your journey? Is that something that you actually need to mm -hmm. do and want to do? Is it important, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, what kind of earning history do you have, right? Mm -hmm. You're bringing on a bigger team. You, you need to be making that money, right? And so has your last year been this amount or that amount? And, and I think those are, you know, case by case, it's, it's really important to kind of figure out, are we going to go forward with this? Does this actually make sense? not just to do it, just to do it. Really, I, I don't think that that's, that's the reason, right? I, I totally agree. I mean, I think, I think that one of the things too, and, and we've got a couple of questions here and I'm, I'm gonna, well, yeah, I'm good. Um, I just wanted to talk too also, we didn't really touch on this, but maybe you could just go to, I know this, this, this changes all the time and there's so much different conversation about it, but with your clients, 
Do you expect them to have a website of their own? Do you expect them to have, what is the importance of demo reels? It seems to change every couple of years, sort of, you know, trends to this way, trends to that way. What do you look for them to have in their sort of toolkit to help you sell them? Maybe you could speak to that. Well, I think well, it, uh, oh, you, no, go, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, here you um, go. Here you go. I think like it's important to remember like a, a demo or a website is basically a way of showcasing your work to a prospective hire, someone who might hire you, right? So uh, if you're a writer, do you need a website? Maybe not, probably not, you know, uh, if you're a director, I would say yes. I would say yes if you're a cinematographer, especially if you're a cinematographer and you also do still photography or you do art exhibits, as I know there's a lot of DOPs who focus in other areas. Um, I think it's important to have that these days, just in terms of communication. Nobody's sending DVD demo reels anymore. I don't think, that, yeah, when's, the last, when's the last time you guys sent out a physical demo reel? To, to a producer, like really, like I, I don't think, like it is, you need some way of showcasing what you can do in an efficient, compact manner. And a demo reel is a useful tool for that. It's not the only tool, but it is a very useful tool. I think and and at, as an editor, I think you can adapt it too. If we know this is the type of job that you're doing, let's, let's make a demo that's actually what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. The technology is here, we can make it happen and you know, fine tune it for what we need. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's not just put it up there. I think it, it has to evolve. It has to change. It has to keep going and be fresh and, and relevant for what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really important. Amy. Yeah, a website's for sure important, especially if you're, um, you know, a head of department, key creative. It's like paramount because sometimes these people don't know you. And so we're suggesting you and they're not going to sort through 17 links to find something that they like. They're want to go to your website, they want to scroll through. It's a very like uh, immediate reaction to your work. Uh, I uh, agree. One, the one caveat that I'd put on it is, um, well, there's two actually. The first is it has to be updated. It's, it's a representative of your work. So if you're going to go and you're, you know, you could spend, make it a make work project and you could do a, a website on Wix or whatever, spend a month on it. But if it looks like a typical everyday thing, that impression of that website can also affect how they view you as an artist. Totally. So it's mm -hmm. got to be something that you feel represents you, that you put a lot of professional time in, that you have put your own stamp of quality onto because yeah. that is the representation they're going to have. Um, and then you have to update it constantly, constantly, constantly. Uh, which can also just be the burden you have to make sure you're willing to take on, especially if you're a busy person, you're going to disappear for nine months on a TV show. Yeah. And go into yeah. Another TV right away, suddenly your website is 18 months, 21 months old, and then it starts to look bad. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part I'll put into this is there, you also have to kind of balance, depending on where you're at in your career, if you want to make sure people looking for you are talking to somebody. So the, the one advantage of a website is that people can go and find out and see your work and possibly call you. The disadvantage of a website is they can go and look and have, you'd have no idea they were even looking. Um, and you wanna make sure somehow that people are also kind of being directed to talk to your representation or to reach out to you or to kind of make sure that there's a connection there that you can uh, go through because it may be that the thing on your website doesn't convey specifically what they were looking for. And that's where we can come in to make a pitch and say, oh, yeah, no, I know it's all sci-fi, but really you can get some procedural elements up and here, you know, put this together for you to help you figure out that on, on this particular show. There, there's no perfect equation there for balancing those things out, but they certainly are considerations to keep in mind depending on what stage of career you're at. Right, that's all great advice. Here's a good question. Um, do you prefer clients to be part of unions before approaching you, i.e. DGC, WGC, CMPA, whatever it is, or, or the cinematographer, CSC? Um, or will you consider taking on non-union talent and helping them break into the, that sort of higher echelon or join the unions to the work? I don't care. Yeah, I don't think it matters. It depends where they are in, in their career. Yeah. yeah. The union affiliation has, is more an indicator, as Jody says, of where they're at in their career. And that's more interesting. That's the, the bigger determinant, less so the union 
long-term status. Right. So I think um, I, 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 I've had this conversation now in about 50 Zooms, um, but I think it's interesting every time because I like to, I like to think of the COVID pause as um, out of this chaos comes you know, a new burst of creativity in regards sure. to storytelling. I look at the positives of it all, even though I think it's gonna be a little Bergman for a while. But I, I wonder whether or not how you guys are all talking with your clients, especially writers, because we all know that's the genesis of the ideas. And if there is an ongoing conversation about, let's look at all the projects, let's look maybe how we can reshape this, or maybe let's just put that aside. And what creatives should be thinking in this new, sort of coming out into this new pipeline of hyperactivity, which will, is about to be hopefully upon us. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. <laughs> is that clear or, yeah. I think you have to be creative. I think now's an amazing time to be creative. You, you, you can, you know, you can, everybody's on a pause. Everybody's trying to figure it out and you can kind of get things done. And, and I think if you're not creative, that's not good right now. Cause you can kind of get into a place where you may never be creative again. Um, I, I'm, I think this is a very interesting time. I'm finding it very fascinating. I'm having great conversations with my clients um, and just everybody, producers, you're able to kind of get to people that you couldn't kind of necessarily, you know, and you're having long conversations. You're able to kind of really get back to that human part that we were talking about before and really kind of develop because going through something like this with somebody, there's something special about it. And, and coming through it and coming out of it it, that bond, I think, is really, really, really special and important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. So, Rob, what do you... I didn't. I was laughing at the cat meowing. I have no... <laughs> that, see, my sound booth isn't working so well because the door's open. But that's my cat. And <laughs> my cat, unfortunately, is blind and old. And, like, you know, it's one of those things. It's like 25. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's fair. It's it's one of those things. I saw your cat come by here. Yeah, and <laughs> he's literally right here. Yeah. He he's literally yeah. right there. No, my cat, she's she's probably unfortunately bumping into a wall somewhere. And, oh, and Did and everyone see the huge dog that came in earlier? <laughs> <laughs> he actually stood right here. I was gonna show you Helen was exactly. talking about it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, um, I, I, I will. I do want to add to this because I, I do agree. That, and we've certainly had a lot of conversations with our clients from day one. And the CBC emergency fund was certainly a, a, a really great uh, thing to happen. I mean, it was a lottery uh -huh. to see who was actually going to get the money. But I think just in galvanizing the amount of creative energy there was and getting people active and getting some things going, I thought it was a, a spectacular mm -hmm. thing for CBC to have done. At the same time, um, just for the people who are listening that are struggling with this, there's yes. an immense amount of stress, there's an immense amount of anxiety that can make it very difficult. And you shouldn't add the anxiety of, I am not being productive, I am not getting things done to the anxiety you might be feeling socially or familially uh, or with your health uh, in this time. Um, and uh, and again, that would also apply to people who are parents. You know, there, we have a number of parents who've kids who are in grade six and under who just don't have the time. They're exhausted mm -hmm. getting up their, their, the other lives have been completely overhauled. Uh, and we've been, uh, you know, trying to coach them through trying to find some time to be creative, but at the same time, not making them feel like they're falling way behind. Should they not be getting things done because they're, they're teachers right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Amy, are you, are you guys, per, are you guys talking to your clients about what they're developing or, you know, what they should be focusing on? Yeah, it's a really great time. I mean, I think um, it's a really scary time, but it's a great time for people to uh, really look inward. And uh, with that comes more expression. So it may not be right now that they're necessarily like writing a masterpiece, but once everything digests this, what this means, uh, they'll get back out there with great stuff. I mean, all the projects that we have that are about uh, pandemics or, <laughs> or whatever, I'm not sure that those are gonna be wildly successful right now, but maybe sometime in the future. Um, I've, we've had a couple of clients have to change pretty big themes uh, that are already at development stage at streamers. 
uh, because they anticipated this. Uh, so we, we're seeing a little bit of creatively, there's a little bit of a shift. I mean, and I think everybody thinks they have the answer you talk to. It's like, everyone's gonna want comedy. Yeah. <laughs> everyone's gonna want, no one's gonna want anything about illness or tragedy or whatever. It's like, you, we just, we, we're just trying to figure it out. I think Jody just said, we're just trying to figure it out. It's, yeah. We're still at the beginning. I'm fearful we're still at the beginning. But we're still at the yeah. Look, I, I mean, it, this isn't like SARS in, in 2003 in no. Toronto where, where no, an actor's like, I'm not coming to Toronto. And then they took that production and went somewhere else, right? Yeah. And we were struggling and trying to figure it out. This is the whole world going through this. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, that's a whole other level of just trying to connect with the right people that you want to connect with mm -hmm. and make it make sense and grow. And kind yeah. of, you know, oh, I like this. I like that. Let's do this. Let's do that. And I think we're all able to kind of do that, which I think is amazing. I really do. I, and I, think I like, Amy, I like what you said as well about how even if you're not necessarily writing, you're, you, you are, there's something, there's seeds are being planted. I think that's really, really important to kind of think about. You may not be at the desk every day typing out, you know, 10 pages, 20 pages a day, but you're sitting with yourself and thinking things are developing and you have to kind of let that creative process, you know, percolate. And I've had conversations with clients who are, you know, stressed and going through this kind of like this constant like wave of anxiety and, and kind of just frustration. And, you know, you say it, it's okay. It's okay. If you're not developing, take some time. You it's important. Your health is more important. Totally. It will come. It will come. You know, yeah. I I think it's it's a, it's like a creative monkhood, you know, where people are spending an, a, for the very first yeah. time. Some people for the very first time are spending a lot of time alone. Who yes. you know what I mean? And that in itself is a very challenging thing to do if you're not if it's not what you're used to doing. And mm -hmm. and in you know all there's so many other things as Glenn said, people being parents that are you know parents that are being now full time teachers, um, and you know all those other things. So I think that there's, um, I, I, I try to say we don't creatively shame anybody during this time for not being productive mm -hmm. because I think I absolutely agree with you, Amy. I think that there is a lot of introspection going on and a lot of deep thought and a lot of band-aids are coming off the social inequities pandemic. And I think there will be, I believe there will be a wonderful multitude of sure. very deep layered, nuanced, provocative work that comes out of this mm. time period. I have great faith in the Canadian system it's and Canadian just, talent. It's not just the, sorry to cut you off. It, it's not just the creators that we're talking about here or I'm talking about here. It's also the buyers. Yes. Like they're also going through this. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it's gonna take some time to level out and um, figure out where their tastes are gonna lie. Um, I just don't think anyone should rush anything or push anything or be anything they're not right now. <laughs> That's excellent advice. So uh, let me just take a look over here. We're at 510. Um, and so um, I know there was one question that I didn't actually really ask you guys and I probably should have. So maybe we can ask it here and then I'll, I'll, it'll give me a chance to look at these questions. But everybody always wants to know, how do you like to be reached out to? How do you like to be approached? Um, you know, I know that sometimes it's through referrals and that sort of thing. Maybe each of you could just sort of talk to uh, how you would like to, uh, people to approach you about representation, if you could. Maybe. So, Rob, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. um, I don't necessarily have a specific uh, preference. Uh, the nice thing with the referral is that if it's someone who's, and the caveat is it's someone whose taste I also admire and like, if they refer, that's really exciting because it's like, oh, well, I, this person, I really respect their taste and their opinion. I'm, it's going to be really exciting, you know? Um, but at the same time, I sign clients based off cold emails to our just general submission email. It, it, it comes and goes. I've gotten it from colleagues, uh, like from referrals from colleagues of mine who are like, oh, you should take a look at so-and-so or what have you. So I, it's really, uh, it's a full full range. If you have a connect, utilize it. If you have, and I mean, this is true across the board. I think if you have a relationship, if you have a network, utilize it, use it. You know, if you're comfortable with it and they're comfortable with it, use it. 
Okay. Great. How about, uh, can I say what don't do? Don't yes. send me the, don't send me the same email that you're sending another agent yes. agency and the same info on and doing it and doing it. Just don't do that because you, you obviously didn't, you don't know who I am or, or that other agent. And I think that if we're going to build a relationship, like know what you're trying to do and don't the general thing. I, I'm not interested right away when I see that and I get the general one and then I, and then you hit me up on LinkedIn or Facebook, whatever it is. You, I'm not that hard to don't find, but he, but but my point is that don't just don't just spam it because it doesn't work. And you can I, tell. You can yeah, always. Yeah, you can tell. totally tell. I, yeah. It's just it, that. Just don't. But otherwise, I'm happy to talk to people. I'm happy to you know see what they're up to and and have those conversations and see where it goes. Amy, I mean these guys are covering it. Uh, it, it happens. I mean, how do we want to be? Email, phone call, referral. Um, but we we don't really take unsolicited material, so there has to be like a way. To get yourself into trouble sometimes there, so you just have to be a way to. There has to be like a grounded way, uh, of connecting. Is that too vague? No, and I think I think that obviously in the in the on the other side of what when it when, when we we can all stand in a room together again at some point in time. I'm sure that you guys also are on other panels or at your industry events, et cetera. You know, if it is, once again, I think this goes back to that whole thing that we talked about at the very beginning, which is like knowing how to act, knowing how to be a professional, totally. knowing mm -hmm. when to approach and mm -hmm. to be able to read the room and say, this might not be a good time, not stepping into a conversation that's already in the middle of something else, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, putting your best foot forward professionally and at, right out of the gate because first impressions do matter as we all know um glenn do you have anything else you want to just sort of say in regards to how you guys no i mean inevitably it's going to be an email because even if you call us we're just going to say send us a script or send us a link an email um you can go to the website uh, and in a live case the only caveat i would add is always introduce yourself with a context as opposed to just walking up to someone and saying hi glenn mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, you know, I still introduce myself to people I've known for seven years, but only see once every, you know, 18 months just to make sure I don't want to make everything awkward. I do the same thing. Just get through that first three seconds where you say, hi, Glenn, you spoke to me at Humber College. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, I have a little question here, and I think this is, well, we've sort of covered this, but anyway, it says, is now a good time to be looking for representation and reaching out to potential agents, giving everything that's going on? Seeing as how you're at home. Yes. But why not? Like, why would it not be a good time? Right? Exactly. I'm just reading the question. Yeah, no, fair enough. I, I think uh, it's always a good time, right? Yeah. It's always a good time to kind of see what's happening because it, it also depends on where you're at in your career, what you're looking to do, right? And so building that relationship takes time, takes effort, takes work. Mm -hmm. right yeah yeah like we're not like i think to, to add on to that um we're not signing someone for the next six months we're signing someone for the next 10 years so this will pass this will go over so when we're looking i, I i'm speaking for myself but i think we all agree like when we're considering someone for representation we're considering their career over the next 10 years or longer so this is uh, this is happening right now and this is certainly something everyone has to deal with and, and consider but ultimately it's not our that's not a factor necessarily in what in our criteria it's, it's not a huge factor i should say right no so i um i think i don't think we have any more questions which is amazing i guess we covered a lot of things. The questions were that good. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. The answer, take the right. <laughs> I think the I think the answers were that good. Yes, exactly. Um, well, listen. I think that overall, I always like to sum it up, um, and I I feel like we could wrap it up with, if you could give. Um, I know that uh, sometimes this is strange, but if you could give a piece of advice to. Um, to all of the creative souls out there right now that are are looking to advance their careers, what would you uh, what would you say to them? 
One good, one good piece of advice, Amy. Amy, go first. <laughs> um, I would say be willing to grow, uh, be willing to dream, and to be nice. Be nice. Excellent okay. advice. Jody. I think be creative right now. I think things are changing a little bit right now, and, and we don't know exactly what that is. And just stand out and do things right now. Um, that, you know, get some attention and find that voice and work on your craft. And it's an exciting time. Excellent. So Rob? I think my cat's saying the same thing. <laughs> yes. Um, so Rob? Expect the unexpected. This is not just for our industry, but I think we're in a time that is going through unprecedented changes at all levels of our society. And I think 20, 30, 40 years from now, you know, we'll be looking back like the the HBO documentary about this time is going to be like that well this was a, a pivotal moment in kind of our society a pivot point and I I don't think anyone really knows what comes next and what there's any real easy way of looking at what future trends will be so I, I think it's it's anybody's game truthfully you know exactly Glenn um I, I'll give two answers. The hard answer is um, it's going to get more competitive. It's the industry yeah. track and it's going to get more competitive and you need to engage in that competition and you need to realize you're in a competition for work and for careers. Um, and so uh, adopting levels of professionalism and work ethic and all those kinds of things are going to be required uh, as we move forward. The second part of that though, which is probably the softer and more optimistic thing, but I actually believe to my core is uh, you were asking what, you know, what we kind of are consistent traits among some of our top clients. And part of that answer is most of my top clients don't think they have any idea what they're doing yet. Um, and that's because they're still on a journey. They're still artists. Still trying yeah. to figure it out. And I think making, you know, being engaged in that journey and, and, and participating in that journey, having some stress from that journey, but also just being an artist um, is always going to open doors for you. And, and so if you take this time or the time, the second wave that's going to come and you just continue to engage in the artistic journey, I think uh, you'll find opportunity on the other end of it. Excellent advice. Well, I always say like, find the joy and experience the magic, you know, and be open to everything. That's the way to go. You know, always be curious. Mm -hmm. um, you can always learn a new trick. Oh my God, we're all on Zoom. Look at this. <laughs> it's so amazing. Well, listen, I want to thank you guys so much. You Annie, can... are you being creative now? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, but I, you... but I, but I did take quite a bit of time to just sit in the feckin' swamp, as I like to call it, <laughs> and just allow it all to sort of, you know, you make great scotch through distillation. So I think that uh, I had a very, very busy year. Sure. You know, I feel very, very blessed. I had, you know, nine months of work and uh, I, I had just been in Los Angeles and I came back home and it was very nice to sort of just sit for a while and think about things. And now I'm yes. And now I'm, you know, back at it. So, awesome. but I'm taking time out to have conversations and to listen to other people talk about process and to learn new things. And I think that's what we're all doing, I hope honing our craft and enjoying the pause. And I know that it's very challenging for some, but I do know that I feel very blessed to be a Canadian totally. in this time because my American friends do not have CERB um, and many of other of the financial uh, you know, aids that we do have. So um, our creative community here at least has been acknowledged by our prime minister, the challenges of it all. So I think that's something to celebrate. Um, I thank you so much. You guys are all wonderful at your craft and I feel very honored to have had this time with you and, um, and thank you for letting me lead the conversation and I'm going to pass it back to Jen. And thank you everybody thank out you. there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really? I was so keen and early on my cue, but here I am. <laughs> attentive um thank you so much everybody and for everybody that's out there listening um 
uh, the industry series will continue next week. So please stay tuned. Next Thursday, we're talking about co-productions. And on Friday, we're talking about adventures in post-production and post-production workflow. So uh, please join us for those conversations as well. And make sure you uh, tune in tonight. We have films starting at 9 p.m. Not one, but two incredible shorts, Swimmers, Age of Dysphoria, that both precede the feature film, Queen of the Morning Calm. So it's going to be a great time. So thank you, everybody. And we will see you very soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hi, thank Bye, you, everybody. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hello, my name is Wendy Potomsky, and I'm the managing partner and owner of Retake Furniture Rentals. Retake is once again a proud supporter of the Canadian Film Festival and is working to contribute to the Canadian film and TV industry by making it an easy and sustainable place to do business. Retake understands the importance of set design and the dynamic nature of the film and TV industry, which is why we created a company to specifically support Canadian filmmakers. Retake provides sustainable short and long-term furniture rental options to meet production schedules and product needs. Our in-house upholstery services can tailor our product to meet your set design requirements and match your color schemes. We use sustainable approaches to minimize product going to landfill when you no longer need the furniture on your set. Retake can also assist you in setting up your office with sustainable alternatives to keep your team working safely as we all head back to work during this unprecedented time. Our goal is to help you create memorable sets. Stay safe everyone and enjoy the films and shorts at this year's Canadian Film Festival.